sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, travel restrictions uh, and this being an NSF funded uh, uh, conference uh, preclude my attendance, but Shane Hudson from uh, the group is there and he can answer any questions. Plus we're working closely with James Glazer on this project. So James is, uh, I believe, there as well and, and uh, can, can further uh, answer questions about our project. So, I'm at the uh, US EPA labs in, in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, uh, working on a project we call the Virtual Embryo, and our focus is trying to develop uh, models and simulations that are biologically informed for uh, developmental systems, particularly mammalian systems, invertebrate systems. And what we're trying to do is use these models and simulations to predict toxicity. Next slide, please. So the grand challenge question surrounding whole cell modeling that we were asked to address is how can cell level modeling help us to achieve quantitative understanding of the structure and function of embryonic systems? Uh, secondly, can computer models that capture what we know about the embryo reliably simulate the induction of developmental defects? And third, how can simulation models support decision making in the context of environmental health and disease prevention? So, working at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. One of the important missions of the agency is uh, uh, providing uh, some of the uh, science that goes behind uh, the environmental uh, laws that regulate uh, the production and the use of chemicals in this country. And uh, in this project, we're particularly interested in uh, addressing effects of chemicals on developing systems, the embryo, the fetus, and the neonate. And this is an important component for children's health. Next slide. So what we're looking to do with these uh, scientific uh, uh, projects is to open a new research path towards what we refer to as predictive toxicology. The, uh, computational models that we're interested in are driven by the types of uh, networks that Andrew just spoke about, signaling networks. Uh, we're interested in placing these in the context of embryological tissue induction. So how do cells interact with one another during development? How do they control spatial patterns? Uh, and uh, ultimately, since development is on a very tight timeline, uh, what types of uh, interactions with these networks and molecular clocks are involved? So these questions are principled uh, on the imputation of molecular and cellular data. We have a whole lot of data in our program that we capture from looking at thousands of chemicals across hundreds of in vitro uh, large data set is really leading to a number of challenges. We can mine a whole lot of biology in terms of chemical interactions with biological systems, but we have to have models that can uh, translate this information into real world uh, uh, information that can be used to make decisions on how chemicals potentially disrupt the embryo. So in our virtual embryo project, uh, this is a theoretical solution to the complexity of the developmental toxicity of compounds, and it leads it to children's health protection. So this is a, a fairly uh, important uh, national effort, and uh, we would love to stay engaged with the virtual cell project uh, in this regard. Next slide. So uh, just a quick example I'll show is some of what we're learning about blood vessel development. So in this particular slide, we have uh, mapped out a thousand or so chemicals in our ToxCast research program where we have a lot of assay data. And uh, on the lower right, you'll see a color wheel that reflects different aspects of blood vessel development that are represented in these assays by cellular and uh, uh, mostly genetic function. These genes in the color wheel are genes that when you knock them out in a mouse embryo, they disrupt blood vessel development. And so we uh, can capture this data uh, and, and put it into a, a format where if you hit a click, please, you can uh, now start to determine what chemicals have effects on blood vessel development in terms of a predictive model. So the size of these slices indicate which genes are affected in the system. And uh, what, what we end up seeing, excuse me, I have somebody else calling, so this can be a ring here. Uh, what we end up seeing is that we can prioritize these chemicals based on the predicted effects on blood vessel development. And this can range from a strong effect 
to a weak effect. So we can now prioritize these chemicals. Next slide, please. And in, in so doing, we can now start to take this cell and molecular data and put them into simulation models. Uh, we're using the uh, CopyCell 3D uh, simulation environment that James Glazer's labs developed, and they'll talk about it later. Uh, but here's just two cases where we can simulate the output of uh, those uh, color wheels, those uh, different predictions, and make a simulated prediction on what the impact might be on blood vessel development. Then go into the laboratory and through uh, different types of in vitro platforms qualify whether or not the prediction holds. And in fact, in these two cases, the prediction showed that the one that predicted a strong disruption of blood vessel development turned out to be, in fact, a very potent inhibitor of blood vessel development acting in the lone animal range. And imazomox, which was not predicted to have an, a, a strong effect, uh, turns out actually to even have a mild stimulatory response. So next slide, please. So the impediments to this uh, type of approach is, is the emergence and integration of cellular behavior. So uh, we really are focusing on multicellular types of uh, interactions, and these, of course, are dependent on the connectivities and hierarchical organization of the system. And so these virtual tissue models must be able to compute how cellular changes combine with one another and then how these uh, lesions propagate to higher levels of biological organization. So we're collecting data at the cellular and molecular level, but the predictions that uh, the EPA is interested in, of course, would be at, at the disease level affecting populations and individuals. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll just end with showing uh, one or two uh, uh, quick examples of how we begin to now uh, integrate this information into higher order embryological in rheological structures, and cellular networks are key to us because uh, we feel that this is how systems translate spatial information to higher order function. And so in the model that's uh, shown here, this is early embryonic limb development, and it's driven by a number of signaling pathways uh, that are expressed in unique uh, spatial patterns, and these signals interact with one another, and this simulation model actually uh, predicts how these signals interact and, and drives a relatively normal-looking limb. Next slide, please. And with these types of models, we can now start incorporating the cellular and molecular data and start making uh, predictions about the consequences of different types of cellular injuries. So in this case, we can begin to model what different amounts of cell loss that could be uh, uh, collected from our in vitro assays might look like if you put it into uh, an embryonic system at this time in development. And you can see uh, that this is modeling different amounts of apoptosis and what the impact might be on early development. So again, we can go in and qualify these experiments, uh, these uh, predictions experimentally. Next slide. And there's a whole lot of different types of behaviors we need to look at. Uh, so you can click that again, please. And uh, uh, what we can do is incorporate uh, lesions at different cellular uh, levels and then predict how the system responds to mixed cellular consequences. What we're learning is that chemicals very rarely do one thing to a cellular function, but they're causing many different effects at the same time. Next slide. Uh, so uh, with this types of approach, uh, we can now start editing these specific cell behaviors, and I'm just ending with a prediction of cleft palate developed by Shane Hudson. Again, he's at the meeting and would love to talk to you about uh, the types of uh, work he's doing, but uh, in, in his simulation, uh, this is looking at a, an important defect, cleft palate, which occurs in the human population, and he's modeling different aspects of palatal fusion at, at the cellular level and then perturbing these uh, different cellular processes with uh, various uh, uh, types of imputed data, or at least that's the plan, and he can actually simulate what might happen if uh, the TGF beta pathway, for example, is disrupted. So next slide, this is my conclusion. So our models uh, bring to the project the potential context for predictive toxicology. Uh, we're looking at new ways to model high-dimensional, uh, high-throughput screening data for potential toxic effects on the system. We want to integrate all of this into what we call adverse outcome pathways, which then take the molecular lesions up to the point of a, a clinically observable disruption and begin to characterize all the steps in between. Uh, the tools that we're interested in are uh, aimed to give quantitative predictions uh, based on the data and knowledge. So Andrew's point about models should be data, not code. I think as we move further along, we'll get more data-driven models and less code-dependent models. And we see this as an important way to generate hypotheses that can inform experimental work. 
Uh, the challenge is, of course, these computer models are not living entities, so we can only script the rules that we understand, uh, and we have to convince the uh, regulatory toxicology community that these are predictive uh, of real-world findings. And uh, uh, so the challenges, again, with complexity of network structure and network dynamics is important, and also we have to begin to find the sweet spots of these models that allow us to enable the biology but not over-specify the performance of these models. So let, next slide, please. And uh, this shows the people that are involved in the project. There's a lot of uh, uh, PIs, uh, a number of postdocs, students, and student contractors. Uh, we have been able to attract some of the uh, first-tier types of postdocs nationally uh, into this uh, work because of their interest in multicellular modeling, as, as Andrew just indicated. It's a very interdisciplinary group, and so one of the challenges is try to uh, get everybody working together and speaking the same language. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll sign off because of the delay, but uh, uh, Shane Hudson or James Glazer, again, would be happy to answer any detailed questions. So thank you.